my Nuzlocke journey first began last year when I first took on Pokemon Blaze Black. Then a week later, I beat Pokemon Blaze Black 2, and then a couple months after that, I beat Pokemon Vintage White. But today, we take on Pokemon Blaze Black 2 Redux Hardcore Nuzlocke. This ROM hack was made by AP Hex Cubed and Driano, so shoutouts to those guys. The game is still made in the same fashion as their other ROM hacks, so go check those out. But in short, just take your base game, add some harder AI, more Pokemon, and better quality of life, and that's your ROM hack. If you guys still don't know what a hardcore Nuzlocke is, then go check out the rest of my channel. I've already completed so many other ROM hacks there. Hopefully they'll give you a better idea of what exactly a Nuzlocke is, and you might as well subscribe while you're there. I'm going to be using the rules on screen right now, so if you don't understand it, don't worry. I'm going to explain it throughout this video. I don't think there's anything else to be said about this game, so let's get started then. So as you guys saw on screen right there, one of the rules of a Nuzlocke is that the number of Pokemon we can use is limited to one per area. And not only that, it's limited to the first Pokemon per area. This means that we can't simply just go around choosing our encounters. So if there's any way of improving the odds of getting better quality encounters, we have to make them happen and give Pokemon like starter choices are one of the many examples. At the start of this game, they're going to be distributing starters from each of the five regions. This means that we can choose which one of the fire, water, or grass type starters we want from each region. And we have to make these choices correctly because we need to make the Pokemon last throughout the entire run. Another one of the rules of a Nuzlocke is that if a Pokemon faints in battle, we can no longer use them for the rest of the game. This means that we want to make sure that every encounter we get is the best that it can be. I'm deciding to reset for a good Oshawa here because Oshawa in this ROM hack has shell armor. If you guys don't know what shell armor is or don't care, then don't worry about it. But... The girls that get it, get it. The girls that don't, don't. Anyway, my encounters before the first gym weren't too too good. Pansier and Krikatoon do learn stab moves early on, so they make for good early game Pokemon, but the rest of the encounters weren't too good. There is a tricky grunt battle in the farm who runs a Mianfu Growlithe lead with Axio and Joltik at the back. This makes for an incredibly difficult fight this early on in the game, considering the fact that we only have 5 encounters. I do end up losing Pidov here to a jump kick, but that really only goes to show how weak it is. Axu and Joltik do pose a threat at the end, but we do manage to make it out with only one death. The gym leader fight with Charon didn't exactly go seamlessly. Charon's a normal type gym leader who can always run stab normal type moves, which is incredibly difficult to deal with. One thing that makes this game very difficult is that it just doesn't give you exactly what you need to win. Against a team like Charon's, whose Pokemon are so aggressive, having a defensively specialized Pokemon would be incredibly useful here. Unfortunately, I didn't get a Pokemon like this, so this battle was quite the struggle. The next attempt though went a lot better. I managed to keep the Pidov alive, and I traded the Azuril for a Ponyta, which is infinitely better. Also, the second Pidov there is actually just Krikatoon. Since 4 of the 5 Pokemon are damage dealing Pokemon, and Ponyta, Oshawott, and Krikatoon actually do have somewhat of a decent defense, this fight was actually pretty easily won. Upon arrival to Verbank City, we're greeted with another choice of starters, this time the Gen 1 starters. I decided that Charmander was the best pick because Charmander seems to be the most useful in the next upcoming gyms. Berg is obviously a bug type gym leader, and Elisa tends to use steel types alongside her electric type Pokemon. Also, Charizard in this game is changed to a dragon fire type, an amazing type combination. After catching the rest of the available encounters, one of them being Magnemite, we move on to the second gym, Roxy. In theory, this battle should be pretty easy. We have a Steel type, and she uses an Ivysaur and Rillipede, which are both weak to our Fire Pokemon, so this should be easy, right? Well, not exactly. On the very first turn, Trubbish explodes, significantly reducing Tranquil's health. This is actually more than okay, because at least she's down one Pokemon, but now we can't really use Tranquil anymore. As the coughing comes in, he's easily walled by Charmeleon, who takes him out with a couple incinerates. Rillipede is next, but my health is a little bit too low to stay in. I send in Duwa to see what damage he can do, and thankfully a crit makes light work of this Whirlipede. I tried to reuse Charmeleon for the Ivysaur, but the health just wasn't there. So, to make a safe switch into Ponita, I had to sacrifice Krikatoon. It was just a small mistake on my part, but it came with a cost. But at the very least, now that Ponita's in, Flame Wheel can take out the Ivysaur. And in order to safely switch into Charmeleon to kill the Ghastly, I had to make another sacrifice here by losing Tranquil. You know, after playing Gen 5 games for so long, I have to say that Black 2 and White 2 have some of the hardest early game. They just don't offer you many solutions for the problems that you have to encounter. Both Roxy and Charon are really hard barriers to face, especially considering that you only have what? 4, 5, maybe 6 encounters? But past this point is what I would consider the start of the snowball. The snowball is the point in the game where any occasional losses won't impact your progress too much. You still got the momentum to move through the game due to the sheer number of Pokemon that you have. This brings up the nice little addition of another starter Pokemon, this time the Gen 2 starters. Again, I decided to go for the fire type because immediate benefits, and we're most likely going to get some more water types later down the line. 
I also managed to get myself this little thing, a near max speed crowbat with 28 speed IVs. This brings us to the next gym leader, Berg. We do have somewhat of a solid plan for him. Both Crobat and Simus here are massive damage dealers, and Odno here serves as a great pivot Pokemon with Regenerator. The one small issue I have with this team is that I've brought a bunch of Pokemon that resist bug moves, but no Pokemon that baits the bug moves, which is kinda unfortunate. Also, Berg's team is stacked with high quality bug Pokemon. Both his Masquerade and Vespiquen have Intimidate, which can lower our physical Crobat's attack, and a Yen Mega that boasts Bug Gem Bug Buzz with Tinted Lens. This means that the first Bug Buzz that Yen Mega uses is 200 base power at the minimum. I lead the battle with Duat, which is part fighting type in this game. This will bait out Air Slashes from the Yen Mega. After protecting the Duat, I can cover the Yen Mega to steal away the Bug Gem. Now, I can safely switch in Simis here and Crobat, who can outspeed and obliterate the rest of Berg's team. There is a mini boss battle with Colrest right after this, who uses a variety of Steel and Electric type Pokemon, but a guaranteed Drill Burt and Relic Passage makes this fight incredibly easy. As we make our way towards Elisa, we really want to look for some fast Ground-type Pokémon. Unfortunately, we don't get any of these, so we're gonna have to brute force this next gym. In the meantime, you will have to fight some random double battles here and there. First is a double battle against Lenora and her husband, and then a tag battle with your neighbor against Ingo and Emmett. I also want to highlight a crucial encounter here. In Lost Lone Forest, I managed to find myself an Ivysaur. Now, small mistake on my part, but I only noticed it in post-editing. The way a Pokemon's abilities are reported is like this. Ability 1, 2, and then Hidden Ability. So the mistake was that I forgot that Hidden Grottos give you the Hidden Ability and not the regular abilities. So when I saw that Ivysaur had Chlorophyll, I thought that it had gotten this Chlorophyll and was a mistake, and not this Chlorophyll, which it was supposed to have. And so I mistakenly changed its ability to Thick Fat, not realizing that it was actually Chlorophyll all along. This isn't really the biggest deal because I don't really use either of the abilities to their best potential, but it's just something worth mentioning. As you can see right now, I'm just prepping for the Elisa fight. The gym battle with Elisa is a triple battle which can be very sporadic depending on how you play. She has a solid team of electric type Pokemon, boasting offensive beasts like Electivire and Raichu, and more defensive Pokemon like Lantern and Stunfisk. In order to play against triple battles, you have to play either very aggressively or very gimmicky, and a Sigilyph, Magneton, and Exedra lead is exactly the way to go. Sigilyph is here to Psyshock the Electivire which can take it out in one shot. I also use Exodrill to dig the Lantern so that it can dodge a Muddy Water and take it out on the next turn. However, this leaves Sigilyph susceptible to a Discharge, which thankfully it doesn't crit. She sends in her Raichu to replace the Electivire, which has kill potential on all of my Pokémon. I swap in Venusaur as Dig comes up to take out the Lantern, and Tri Attack from Magneton takes out the Amolga. As she swaps in Stunfist and Zebstrika, I switch in Charizard for Magneton to take the Flame Charge, and I target the Raichu with a Dig. Giga Drain does big damage to Stunfist and heals me some health, as Earth Power misses Charizard since it has Levitate. Flame Burst does have health as Zebstrika, as Dig comes up and misses the Raichu. Thankfully though, the next Giga Drain does take out the Stunfisk, and a 1-2 combo from Venusaur and Exodrill takes out the Raichu. This earns us the 4th Gym Badge of this hectic fight. Coming out of the 4th Gym and moving on towards the 5th, you'll encounter a triple battle with Heartbreaker Charles. Now, this fight can be difficult if you're not expecting it, but with proper planning, you should do fine. There's also a couple encounters here that would serve really usefully. Ooh, Pelipper has a... Uh has Drizzle. Ooh, we're going Pelipper. It's only a 10% chance to get the Pelipper though, so... Oh. Never mind. <laughs> so, before you know it, a few more encounters, a couple of items, and you're prepping for the 5th gym. In case you didn't know, one of the easiest way to build a really overpowered team is to send to your Pokémon around a weather effect. In Clay's case, this would be the Sandstorm. Now, looking at his team, the Sandstorm isn't really that beneficial, only his Exodrill can really take advantage of the sand, but the fact that it's even there is already threatening enough. Considering the fact that we're facing off against a mono ground team, I actually don't really have that many good counters. Let's see how we do. Am I confident? Uh, decently. I have somewhat of a plan, but uh, <laughs> nothing concrete. Well, I say that, but I really do have a plan. I start by getting rid of the Sandstorm by sending in Drizzle Pelipper. This allows Lilligan to take out the Hippowdon with a simple Giga Drain. He tries to send a Nidoking to counter with Cross Poison, but Exodrill's a Steel type and can hit back with a killing Drill Run. Seismato comes out to use a Rain Boosted Water move, but he's easily walled by Venusaur. Torterra's Head Smash crits Venusaur, leaving us on 1 HP, but I manage to get the Sleep Powder off, and Sludge Bomb crits, allowing us to take out the Torterra next turn. However, this leaves us in a very bad position for the Garchomp, since it's so freaking powerful. There has to be an out somewhere. There has to be an out somewhere. Why did I bring Typhlosion here? Any other water type Pokemon would have done so much better than, than Typhlosion here. Okay, um, I think I see it though, but it involves sacking Typhlosion. 
So we go here to take the Earthquake. Typhlosion for the E-Speed. We outspeed with Typhlosion. Go for the extra sensory. Yeah. We outspeed. Uh, why, did I, why did I bring Typhlosion here? That made no sense to me. We're sacking Typhlosion. What a waste of a Pokemon. I just threw away my Typhlosion for no reason. Okay. I don't know. I could have played that so much better if I just brought another Pokemon. That's not Typhlosion. So yeah, not really the best played gym fight, but at least we made it out alive. After confronting Team Plasma at the PWT, we make our way to Route 6 where I catch myself in Emolga, an extremely important encounter. As of right now, I don't have any fast Pokemon that can deal super effective damage to any of Skyla's Pokemon, so this Emolga encounter is incredibly important. In front of Chargestone Cave, where we might get another Electric or Rock Pokemon, our rival here challenges us to a Pokemon battle, but since it is a single battle, we can easily wipe the floor with him. Okay, in this cave, we have a chance of getting a Dino, which is incredibly good. Please give me Dino. One in three chance of getting a Feebas. Getting a Durant in here would have been much better, but Dur Durant is only 10% chance, and Feebas is 35. Nice. Joltik, which is pretty good. Uh, Electrode is also pretty good. Durant is really good. Yes! Okay, that's actually amazing. No, it's not. Remember how I said that this game never gives you exactly what you want? Well, this is another example. You see, even though this Joltik is good, it doesn't actually get a good Electric-type move until level 57, where it gets Discharge. And if you check the level cap for Skyla, the level cap is 55. Meaning that even if I did edge my Pokémon, Galvantula still won't have a good Electric-type move. I think the game is designed so that it doesn't get a good Electric move until after Skyla, which is stupid. Before fighting Skyla, we have one more interesting battle. And instead of me guiding you through it, let me just show you what the fight looks like. What the f*** am I looking at? I did not know that Godzilla and Mechagodzilla could be implemented into this game, let alone R2-D2 and a giant metal cascoon. But alas, here we are. I mean, I'll try my best, but who knows how this goes. Okay. Uh, does it get off the red card immediately? I guess not, okay. Okay, so UFO, this is 50-50 between Aeroblast and Psychic. Rock Slide. We just need to hit both Rock Slides. Or just the one. Okay. Or not, or not. Maybe it's fishing for a plus attacks? That's a crit. That's not a crit? Oh my goodness. We have to counter here then, right? We have to counter and hope for non-crit. Let's hope that was a high roll, this low rolls. How much damage is this? Perfect. Okay, not too bad. Not too, too bad. Oh, I was dead to a crit there. Kind of an awkward battle, but whatever. That's cool. That's cool. Time for the Skyla fight. Skyla is another incredibly difficult triple battle because she takes everything you know about battles and shoves it down your throat. This fight can be incredibly dangerous because there's so much you have to worry about. Items, abilities, movesets, priority moves, it's just a lot to take in. However, right, listen carefully, we can circumvent this incredible difficulty by pulling an Uno Reverse and sending in a Pokemon who's willing to take it down their throat. Samurott here acts as a bait spreading its throat wide to take Flying-type moves. This allows Magneton to safely take out the Togekiss. On the next turn as she sends out Pidgeot, Thunderbolt takes it out and she sends in Gliscor as a replacement. I double swap Magneton and Corsola for Samurott and Milotic to take the incoming Head Smash and Earthquakes, and a Surf from Pelipper takes out both the Gliscor and the Aerodactyl. Swana simply goes down to a Thunderbolt as Hurricane finishes off the Jump Off. This finally earns us a 6th badge. The next portion of the game is a long stretch of story progression. There's a lot of encounters, grunt battles, dialogue, it's all very boring stuff that I'm not going to make you watch. None of the battles are really that hard, and the dialogue isn't really relevant to the Nuzlocke, so I'm just gonna point out some of the important parts. This battle girl in Lentmust Town gave us a TM for T-Bolt, and we also got an encounter for Drapion. 
One of the most recurring Elite Four members for my Gen 5 Nuzlocke is Gliscor, and Reversal Mountain is one of the locations we can get a Gligar. But I forgot to use my Repel, so we got the Drapion instead. Still an incredible recurring Elite Four member. Oh shit. Oh fuck, I forgot. Um... That's... Okay, I'll take that. I'll take that. So it is Sniper and not Battle Armor. That's kind of cringe. At least it means this thing can absolutely sweep Grimsley. I forgot to mention this before, but in Celestial Tower, I caught myself a Miss Magius. And I might not know it now, but Miss Magius is one of the most crucial encounters for the Elite Four. In Reversal Mountain, we do have to face off against a double battle against Bianca, and this fight can pose as a challenge. Her two lead Pokemon are Musharna and Mian Shao, while I start off with Crobat and Galvantula. Acrobatics from Crobat can easily take out the main Xiao, but then Crobat has to tank a Psy Shock from the Musharna. Thankfully on the next turn, we leech see the Musharna to get some health back, and Surf takes out both the Musharna and the next Emboar. Her next two Pokemon are superior in hacks, so I U-turn Crobat out into Miss Magius, and swap out Milotic for Gardevoir. Moonblast from Miss Magius takes out the Haxorus, as a Gardevoir Moonblast takes out the incoming Samurott. This just leaves the superior who goes down easily to a Dragon Pulse from Charizard. This fight would have been much more difficult if I wasn't prepared, and I didn't have level advantage, so I would definitely consider this fight one of the few run killers. Before proceeding to the next gym, there's one more battle to recognize. A surprise battle against Benga, Alder's son. He wields a wicked team of super aggressive Pokemon and pseudo legendaries, so this fight is bound to be difficult. Alright, so this is Focus Sash. So we Volt Switch out of here to break the Sash. This should see Ice Punch. Ice Punch is fine. That is a little trick. Wait, hold on. No, doesn't Blaze Kick thaw me? I swear it does. No? Okay, I swear it does. I guess it doesn't then. Okay. Mag is always faster, and we have Levitate, and we're a fairy type in this game. Moonblast should always kill. Uh, I think we are expert belt? Yeah. Oh boy. Simple answer is just Scorching Sands. V-Create and Wild Charge, I think, are usually recoil moves, but the game patched it so that they're no long they don't they no longer deal recoil, so this Emboar no longer gets reckless boost, which is super super weird. Okay. We were dead to a crit. Acro should wreck this thing. Oh yeah. What's last? Punk? We can go for Acro, because none of its moves can do too much damage to us. Too easy! Too easy! Too easy. I am I am four levels above, but like, whatever. I am Jose Mourinho. After catching our last few encounters, one of which being a Shell Armor Lapras, we face off against Drayden, the seventh gym leader. Drayden specializes in the Dragon type, so this fight should be really difficult, right? He has a Salamence, Haxorus, the newly Dragon type Sceptile and Charizard, the Bug Dragon Flygon. Even his Dredigan isn't anything to laugh about with rough skin Rocky Helmet. This fight should be difficult, right? No, 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 he really isn't. Because he only fights you in a single battle, you can easily navigate around his moves and just one-shot his Pokemon. Moonblast one-shots his Dredigan, and d pulls from Charizard kills his own Charizard and Haxorus. When he swaps into Flygon, Ms. Magius outspeeds and kills it with the Moonblast, and Acrobatics from Crobat takes out the Superior. Finally, we U-turn the Salamence into Lapras, and Lapras finishes them off, easily winning us the 7th badge. Probably one of the easiest gym battles. Lapras is a guaranteed encounter at Village Bridge, and if you made it this far, then you most likely do have a good counter for Dragon types. After Drayden is another long series of story progression. More battles, Grunt Gauntlets, encounters, but eventually we do reach Humalau City. Now you might have noticed that the Hoenn Gym Leaders are scattered around the Unova region. This is because they pose as extra challenges for those who want it, and they just make the game a little bit harder. 
I only started fighting them around Watson because that's when I found out that they actually battle you, but even then they're still not that difficult because they're literally just worse gym leaders. The only one that's worth mentioning is Tate and Liza because they're the only ones that are not single battles, so they actually do pose somewhat of a challenge. Bug Buzz from Galvantula is 4 times super effective against Gothitelle because Gothitelle's been changed to a dark psychic type in this game. At the same time, we U-turn into Reuniclus to send in Crocodile to take the thunder. As they send in their Lunatone, we Brutal Swing with Crocodile as we switch out Galvantula for Drapion. When they send in their two ace Pokemon, we Sucker Punch the Alakazam and we Cross Poison the Gardevoir taking it out. Of course, we do have to survive an Energy Ball from the Alakazam, but luckily it doesn't kill. This just leaves the Alakazam left who simply dies to a Sucker Punch. Their last Pokemon, Solrock, also dies to a Sucker Punch, winning us over Tate and Liza. As you can see, this battle isn't that difficult, but it can definitely pose as a challenge if you're not prepared. Anyway, time for Humalao City's gym leader, Marlin. Marlin is an incredibly hard gym leader to fight. Remember what I said about Clay, where planning a team around a weather effect makes it incredibly broken? Rain is the worst of it. Rain is the easiest way to make a really broken team, and it is incredibly hard to play around. If we look at Marlin's Pokemon, two out of his six Pokemon are rain setters. This means that trying to get rid of the rain is out of the question. But then if we look at the rest of his Pokemon, they all have Swift Swim, which doubles their speed in the rain, which means that we will have to be playing against his team always slower. Her two lead Pokemon are Ludi and Pelly, so I decided to double up into Ludicolo since Pelipper can't really do that much damage to either of my Pokemon. When he sends out the Wailord, I protect my Kingdra because it's now baiting killing moves, and a Grass Plague from Venusaur takes out the Wailord. The same fate happens to Poliwrath as I swap in Miss Magius for Kingdra. When he sends out his own Kingdra, he sees a killing flash cannon onto Miss Magius, so I swap in Magneton and put the Kingdra to sleep with Sleep Powder. Now that the Kingdra can't really do anything, Venusaur is safe to go for a healing synthesis as the Thunder from Magneton takes out the Pelipper. Both of their Pokemon wants to take out Magneton with a water move, so I swap in Seismotoad to take the Waterfall as a Grass Pledge from Venusaur takes the Kabutops down to Focus Sash range. I swap Venusaur for Miss Magius because Moonblast is the only thing that can take out the Kingdra, but I get hit by a Rock Slide from Kabutops anyway, dealing massive damage. On the next turn, I protect Miss Magius to keep it alive as I go for an Earthquake to take out the Kabutops. Then, a couple more hits from Seismotoad takes out the Kingdra, winning us the final Gym Leader battle. After a final, I promise, last one. After a final stretch of long story progression, we finally get to the point of the Team Plasma resolution. Here, there are two battles that I want to highlight. First is a double battle against Zinzolin, and the second is a triple battle against Colrus. Zinzolin is the easier of the two. All we need to do is remove the Vanillax, getting rid of the Hail, and then we can blow the f out of his team. Volt Switch from Emolga breaks the Sash on Vanillax, and then Blaziken sets up the Sunny Day. Since Emolga baits Ice type moves, I swap in Rapidash to not get frozen, and then Flare Blitz from both of our Pokemon takes out his entire team. The fight against Colrus, however, is much more difficult, as I'll show you now. Okay. Did I get my... Uh, did I send out my Pokemon in the right order? I did, okay, thank goodness. Flare Blitz, Magnezone, Fire Pledge, Metagross, and Crunch, Behia. This we can do predictably. One. That's one. I, I don't know why I'm stressed. I know it's gonna kill. <laughs> like, I, I literally calculated all this. I don't know why I'm still stressed. It's not these three that are that are uh, funny, it's the next three that are going to be really, really flipping difficult. If it sends out Rotom Wash in the center, then I'm kind of screwed and I'm almost certain. And I'm very likely to lose a Pokemon. Okay, speed boost. Okay, oh, fuck. Okay, um... Yeah, now I'm kind of regretting not giving Blaziken a Pasho Berry. Um, Porygon Z, it can only attack Blaziken. This Rotom can kill either Sharpedo or Blaziken, and I don't want to risk either of them, so we're going to switch both of them. This is going to switch into here, which has Water Absorb. In that case, we'll Fire Pledge the Porygon, and we will switch you. Actually, we'll protect this side, so that at least next turn we can guarantee the Rotom goes for an Electric move into Sharpedo. Okay. I don't know if this kills. It's pro this probably won't. Maybe half health? Okay, I'll take that. Interesting. 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 Do not double up then. I guess that's the problem. Okay, you can take this. You're a dragon type. You're a dragon type. Okay, um... 
That's a crit, that's why. We'll kill the Porygon, switch you out for probably this, and then we'll, we'll switch you out... Sorry, my mic's a little bit loud. Is that... Yeah, okay. Um... I think that's... Okay. Right. Only I drain punched, right? At least I drain punched. Okay. Okay. Grass pledged the Rotom, and this will close combat because. Ah. Uh, no, I have Pasho Berry on Crocodile. I think this should be okay. I think this should be okay. I don't think it's gonna go for a Hydro Pump. We knew about this berry. We knew about the berry. Okay. Try attack. That's okay. That's fine. Perfect. Drain punch kills. And then we, we're just one Pokemon left. No, why would you? Why would you? You saw the Pasho berry! Why would you? <laughs> Losing Crocodile here was incredibly unfortunate. Any fast dark Pokemon, especially a Moxie Crocodile, would have been insane in the Elite Four. So it was a huge loss to have lost it here. But now we're officially in the end game. There's only Getsis, Victory Road, and then the Pokemon League. All right, let's blow the f out of this Kiram. So we're gonna do some trickery here. As you can see, I'm leading with Zoroark with Cloyster in the back. In theory, this should only use electric type moves into uh, the Cloister. We're gonna go to Charizard, who can one-shot this with Dragon Pulse from this, uh, from this helm. Perfect. Perfect. This is Life Orb, so we should kill. Yeah. Yeah. And the actual Kirin fight itself isn't too, too bad as well. Uh, it's a single battle, so... Just send out Pokemon one after the, one after the other, and you, you should be fine. So we specifically gave Zorark a Wise Glasses so that Dark Pulse always one shots. Dark Pulse is changed to never miss instead of flinching, so no need to worry. Ghost Fairy type is absolutely insane. What? But it's Dynamic Punch. Okay, that scared me. Like I said, you can you can just send out Pokemon one after the other and it won't do anything. It can't retaliate. Fire Pledge, and that's four down. Okay. Okay, what's left? Uh Gyarados and Electros. We don't care about the berry. We don't care. This should kill. Perfect. Probably should have um, uh, sleep powdered first. But that gets us! Nice and easy. Nice and easy. The end is so close, I can nearly taste it. But there's one more roadblock before we can enter the Elite Four. At the end of Victory Road, there is a Weather Gauntlet team that you have to face off against. First, you have to fight two trainers back to back that run a Hail team and a Sun team. Then, you gotta do the same thing again against the Rain team and then back to back with a Sand team. Then you have to fight Lance in a single battle. This is quite possibly the most difficult gauntlet leading up to the Elite Four. First up is the Hail team. To immediately remove the Abomasnow from battle, I hit the Abomasnow with a super effective Blaze Kick, ignoring the Akaberry and taking it out. Once she sends out Cloyster, I U-turn into Empoleon to get off a couple Flash Cannons. I date the calculations and Flash Cannon always kills from this range. The incoming Glaceon wants to go for an Earth Power, so I swap into Pelipper to get the Drizzle in and remove Glaceon's Snow Cloak effect. I then pivot into Starmie to take the Blizzard, then swap into Kingdra to use a Flash Cannon and take out the Glaceon. The Vanilla she sends in resets the hail with Snow Warning, so I make the switch into Blaziken who can take it out. A Blaze Kick hits the Vanillax and the Vanillax goes down. The next Pokemon Jinx doesn't outspeed Blaziken, so a simple Blaze Kick also takes him out. 
and when she swaps in Weavile, I send in my own Charpedo to use a Wave Crash and take out the Weavile. Now we do get healed between the Hail Trainer and the Sun Trainer, but we don't get to switch teams, so we're using the same team going into the next battle. There isn't anything that Blaziken can do to the Torkoal, so I swap in Pelipper to get off the Drizzle and prevent the Torkoal from getting off a first turn Solar Beam. A Rain Boosted Surf then easily takes it out the Torkoal. Their Drought Ninetales re-establishes the Sun, so I swap into Starmie and get off a Rain Dance to prevent a killing Solar Beam. This time, a Boosted Surf takes out the Ninetales. With the Rain up, his Grass Pokemon don't get the Chlorophyll boost, and his Fire Pokemon don't get the Sun boost. This makes the rest of the Sun team an easy victory. After switching out my team, we're ready to face the Rain and Sand Trainers. The Rain team starts with a Pelipper to set up the Rain. Starmie's Thunder with Life Orb easily takes out one shot, ignoring the Walkin' Berry. The next four Pokemon, Seismitoad, Kingdra, Ludicolo, and Politoed, all get soloed by Venusaur, putting it to sleep, and then using Giga Drain. The last Pokemon is Rotom Wash, which simply gets walled by Kingdra, goes down to a couple serves, winning us against the third battle. The last battle is against the Sand Team, which is a little bit more difficult than the rest. He starts off with a Gigalith that sets up the Sand with Sandstream, so I go for Starmie to use Surf. Since Sand does give Rock-types the special defense boost, Surf isn't able to take it out, so when I go for the second Surf, he makes a switch into Cradilly to take it in with Storm Drain. Seeing how a plus one Giga Drain is definitely able to take out Starmie, I make the switch into Min Xiao to use Close Combat to take out the Cradilly. The incoming Tyranitar does hold a Choppel Berry, but Min Xiao's attack is so high that we can ignore it and simply go for a Close Combat to take out the Tyranitar. Out comes the Garchomp, I decided that in order to make a safe switch into the next Pokemon, I have to sack Min Xiao here. I go for the Close Combat expecting to sack Min Xiao, but we actually manage to get a crit to take out the Garchomp. Unfortunately, we still do take the Rough Skin damage and the Sandstorm damage, which is enough to still take out the Min Xiao. Extra Drill goes down to a Rain Boosted Surf, and Needle King goes down to one from Kingdra. Finally is the Gigalith that he swapped out, and the Simple Surf takes him out. With all four trainers defeated, the one final barricade between us and the Elite Four is Lance. Alright, we will be playing into crits in this battle. Aerodactyl, Focus Sash, gotta break it. The only Pokemon that's faster than this thing is my Crobat, so we U-turn out, and we swap into Steelix, which you guys cannot see because I did not update the team. We'll kill this with Heavy Slam, but we need some chip damage. Oh, shoot. Uh, I think everything's fine. I did forget to account for the chip damage from Stone Edge, uh, Stealth Rocks. I think Rocks damage is gonna be a little bit sticky. Ice Beam, ugh, yeah, mmm. Because we we're going Mighty Yenna against Gyarados. What can you do about this, right? What can you do? If it, if it Dragon Dances now, then I think we're dead. Power Whip, okay, don't kill, don't kill, don't kill. There isn't a range to kill, actually. Just don't crit, perfect. Okay, this is random move. Go for the extreme speed. That would be the best case scenario. Or, or even the, the agility, that works too. That's fine. That's fine by me. Felix, you beast! You beast! Okay, that's nice. That's very, very nice. Most likely Earthquake. No way it's Cross Poison. Potential Dragon Rush slash Earthquake. We should be able to take one. Uh, we don't want to... Because it has red card, we actually don't want to U-turn it. Perfect. Perfect. Charizard, I think we can kill this, no? Nice and easy. You ain't no dragon trainer. You ain't no dragon trainer. There is technically a rival battle right after this, but it is a single battle and it's not really that difficult, so I'm not going to bother mentioning it. The last part of this video is going to cover the Elite Four, and I'm not going to do a voiceover because I don't want to take away from the high tension of these battles. I think I've done enough throughout the rest of this video to illustrate exactly what my planning situation is like and how my thinking process goes, so I really hope that you've enjoyed this video if you've made it this far. Five, six out, hmm, four or five hours of planning, not six. Okay, I think you guys all saw on the document, we can straight up just moonblast this and kill. Easy. Punch Crow, again, we can also just Moon Blast this thing, take it out.
Simple. Simple. Uh, you also saw that we can take out the... Uh, okay, hold on. Okay. Am I being... Stupid? Am I stupid? Am I- am I stupid? How did it outspeed me? Am I like... not smart? It says gentle in my document, but it's often been wrong. Very, very often it's been wrong, so... I- I can't say for sure. I swear that killed. It's about the same. Okay. So I don't know if this is the Zoroark or the actual Drapion. I'm gonna U-turn. We're faster anyway, so... And then we'll judge how much damage it does. Okay, so that's- okay, so that's the Zoroark. Perfect. What's last? Just the Drapion? Yes. Easy. Okay, perfect. Grimsley is the easy leap for, though, because he is a single battle. It only gets harder from here. That's all I'll say. Alright, so as I... S well, I didn't say it, but, like, it's important that we're baiting Blaziken at the back for Zoroark because we need to bait Psychic moves into my right side. So we're gonna Nasty Plot here. And we're gonna protect... Blaziken. Uh, not Blaziken. Zoro. This way, they will only attack my Blaziken, or thinking it's my Blaziken, without doing damage. That'll keep... Okay, I'll take that. Ooh, I don't have a move that can kill both of them then. A Trick Room is almost guaranteed to be set up. Just to break Sash. I wish we could double Snarl. Oh my god, that'd be so nice. Okay, but this means it's almost guaranteed to have a Trick Room set up now. Yeah. I did not see that. I couldn't really tell you why I didn't play, play around that. Darmanitan is now faster than us. It should see a Psychic. We can protect this turn to save the illusion. Okay. Who else has Trick Room here? I get rid of the Glade with Moonblast. Let's just Snarl. Psychic. Okay. As long as my illusion is still alive, they can't do anything to us. Even with Trick Room, they're basically useless. Because they're all so aggressively special. The soul's also specially aggressive that they always see the kill into my Blaziken, my actual Blaziken, that they can't see that it's just a Zoroark. There's no way Metagross can kill my Blaziken. Because if it can, then it might go for Rock Slide. Yeah, no way, no way. Which means that this Metagross always goes for Meteor Mash, so Miss Magus protects. And then we Snarl this side, killing the Darmanitan. That's fine. That's fine. What? They still haven't broken my illusion yet. I'm still in the clear. Meteor Mash is okay. That is completely fine. They should kill both of them. Oh, what a well-played fight. What a well-played fight. Even though I didn't uh, take the... Uh, what's it called? The Trick Room into account? That was a well-played fight. I have to say so myself. So, we're gonna do a very similar plan as to Caitlyn, right? So they should, in theory, both see close combat into my Excadrill, which is actually just my Zork. Of course, if they actually hit the Excadrill, then my Zork's 
fucking dead, right? Psychic Infernape. We're gonna swap into Miss Magius, who should be able to take the close combats. This is sashed, so it's gonna it's gonna live. It will live. You know what? There could be worse things to do. Again, Psychic to kill the Infernape. Moonblast kill the Hitmon top because we gave it Wise Glasses, I think. Yeah. The wise Glasses should always kill. Yeah. Starmie is the only one that's faster. And this is a range to kill, I think. Hitmon top has actually kind of decent defense. So I think this is like, yeah. One out of like 16 to not kill. Lucario. Yeah. As we expected. And then this just dies. And now it sends in the Kong. Lucario dies to Blaze Kick. And both of our Pokemon outspeed. Nice. And then this just leaves the Breloom, I think? Okay. Uh, these double battles haven't been too hard just yet. They haven't been too hard just yet. So, Chantal is a triple battle, right? She has a mix of ridiculously offensive Pokemon in Gengar Miss Magius and ridiculously defensive Pokemon in Sableye. We're gonna take the odd one out being Sableye. We're just gonna kill the Sableye. So, Starmie is faster than the uh, Gengar. Miss Magius is faster than the other Miss Magius. And this should just obliterate the Sableye. And depending on what it sends out, that's when it gets kind of weird. Okay, um, okay, so it, I wrote in my notes, literally, if Golurk is on the right, Cattle Ball is M Miss Magius, I shock the Gengar, swap Blaziken for Crobat, because that's what's gonna kill the, the Blaziken. Oh, that's why I put the Cassim Berry so that it doesn't go Shadow Punch into my Starmie. That's why. Okay. So I am smart. I am smart. This should destroy the Gengar's... I'll stop there. Which guarantees the uh, high horsepower into Blaziken. Shit. Oh, fuck. I forgot about that. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, thank God. So Miss Maggie is Shadow Ball Chandelure. We're still faster. Golurk is never gonna attack my Starmie now because it, it sees an Ice Punch into Crobat. Shadow Ball kills the Chandelure. Gold kills the Miss Magius. You turn out of the Golurk, and we're just gonna hope Golurk doesn't crit into uh, either of my Pokemon. So really, the important thing is that you don't Ice uh, Shadow Punch into my Starmie to, and crit it. That's the only thing that matters. That dies. Ice Punch. We live the crit. We can live a crit. Okay. And now how do we do this? Okay, so Jellicent needs two hits to kill, I think? Golurk needs two hits, right? So what if I did this? Battle Ball Jellicent. Scald the Golurk. I Snarl? Is that is that gonna work? No. Not even. We just have to hope they don't go for the Zorak then. We don't... Ooh, actually, I do kind of freaking need the Zorark. <laughs> okay, so the Jellicent dies. Just don't attack my Zorark then. Go, you know what? Go for my, go for my Starmie. Go for my Starmie. Shadow Punch. Shadow Punch it. Shadow Punch. Shadow Punch. Fuck! Ah! Damn it! No! Ah, uh, I should have saved... I should have uh, risked, like, Excadrill or something. Damn. Okay, okay, we got this. <laughs> Come on. We're only one Pokemon down, right? Only the Pokemon that I needed absolutely on my team. All right, Superior, this is an easy clap.
Nice. I don't know why I didn't I didn't edge you for some reason. That's fine. Alakazam. Here it is. This is Focus Sash. I think I'm gonna have to sack, go into Crobat, you turn into Starmie, and kill it like that. Yeah, if, if we were sacking anything, it would have been the Excadrill. Alright, see ya, buddy. You did jack shit on this fight. <laughs> That's fine. Nothing on this team outspeeds my Crobat or Starmie, so this kills, right? This just kills? Sweet. Latios. Deep Pulse is kind of a lot. That's Ice Beam. Come on. Okay, we have to... Do we live this? Yeah, we, we, we can live a non-crit. Come on. Darmy, you fucking beast. Darmy, you beast. Ice Beam. I, we Ice Beam sack, go into... What's it called? This Magius, and we win, right? Darmy. Thank you so much for what you've done. Is this it? Crobat, am amazing Pokemon to do like switches. Starmie, the coverage god, the coverage god. Blaziken, Blaziken's there for big power. Reckless Fire Gem fla Flare Blitz. Insane. Miss Magius. The typing of Miss Magius is so broken. And then of course Zorark, which is always great on a Gen 5 Elite 14. And then there's Excadrill, which, which uh, didn't really do anything. Oh, I'm tired. And I have to wake up early tomorrow? Piece of shit.